Good morning and welcome to another session, Wired's Live Living Room Sessions. Today, we're going to be looking and having a really interesting discussion with Annalie Davis. On Tuesday, CPRI's Jen Ward discussed how one man's passion for regenerative agriculture turned into an ecotourism business with Mahmood Patel of Cocoa Hill Forest. I highly recommend that you visit Cocoa Hill Forest and you can catch the recorded session on Wyatt's YouTube channel. Living Room Sessions are also now being streamed live on YouTube, so be sure to check us out and subscribe. We've been listening to you, and through our social media polls, you have told us that 1 p.m. is the best time for our shows. So from next week, Tuesday and Thursday, we're going to start our shows at 1 p.m. And we will continue to explore the topics of regenerative agriculture, climate change, building biodiversity, and renewable energy. My name is Keisha Farnham, and I am from Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education, and Design. And we are pleased to bring you this series in collaboration with our education partners, the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute, and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. Today is quite special. It is the second in a series of interviews we will be doing with the creative or orange sector. Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with Annalie Davis. Annalie's practice works at the intersection of biography and history, focusing on post-plantation economies. Her studio is located on a working dairy farm once operated in the 17th century as a sugarcane plantation. This context offers a critical space for her practice, which engages the residue of the plantation society. Annalie is also the founder of an artist-led collaborative called Fresh Milk and is the co-founder and co-director of Caribbean Linked, an annual res residency in Aruba and Tilting the Axis, an independent visual arts platform throughout the Caribbean annually. In 2019, she published her bilingual book titled On Being Committed to a Small Place and launched her solo exhibition, Heartseed, in Costa Rica. Her article on beach plots was recently published in the online magazine, Pre. Annalie's work has taken her near and far with exhibitions as far as Bangladesh and Austria. So you can see why I'm so excited to have Annalie on the show today. Hello, Annalie, how are you doing? And where are you joining us from? Hi, Keisha, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm so pleased to be part of the forum. Um, so I'm joining you from Walker's Dairy in St. George, as you had mentioned. Um, so that image there uh, that's just popped up, the long kind of white roof building, I'm just to the left of that. There's a smaller white roof and my studio is under those uh, that grove of mahogany trees. So I'm here in the St. George Valley. Um, this estate is um, it's currently 120 acres. It's been in our family for 100 years. It, came into the family through my paternal great-grandmother. Um, my brother has been managing it for over 30 years, so it's converted from its original uh, working as a sugarcane plantation from 1667, and he's converted it into dairy farming. So we now house uh, about 140 cows. But what's interesting about where I am is that we're actually connected. Um, so this Walker's Dairy was owned at one point by someone called George Walker in 1722. And from my research, it seems as though he also acquired the site where Wired and the CPRI is, a Walker's in St. Andrew. Okay. So we have that kind of connection to two Walker's. Um, yeah. I think we're also connected in another way, in, in, in the way in which there's a sort of transformation of these sites from uh, sites of extractive economies. Um, so you're shifting from a uh, sand quarry to this permaculture site on a quite a large scale and on a very small scale, the intervention of the work I'm doing as an artist and a cultural activist and managing a space like fresh milk into this, into this site. Um, and if I could add to that, I know a lot of our stories about, um, post-colonial states like Barbados often begin with the settler colonial class, but our work 
my work with an archaeologist, Matt Riley, um, we've been doing these digs here at Walker's for a number of years to try and find the site of an enslaved village. And last summer, he found um, this artifact, which I'll just show briefly, which nice. actually means that we can tell our story from much earlier than the settler colonial class. That goes back to like 1000 or 1450. Um, he's been able to sort of date that particular shard to the Suezoid tradition. So that's a very long answer to where I am. <laughs> it's a very interesting answer to where you are. And I think it sets the stage perfectly for our discussion. Um, you know, one of the quintessential elements of the regenerative agricultural process is phytoremediation. It's a big word, right? And it is the bioremediation process. So it uses various types of plants to remove, transfer, stabilize, or destroy contaminants in the soil and groundwater. Um, and you have said that your practice considers the Caribbean as a site of disease, soil degradation, biodiversity loss, and mastering of the land and um, via mono, uh, monoculture, obviously through the sugarcane industry and then of course through the tourism in the case of Barbados and many other of the Eastern Caribbean states. Um, so moving into that discussion, how does your work capture the transition from disease, soil degradation, monocropping and biodiversity loss to this positive aspect of phytoremediation? Yeah, so the word phytoremediation, you know, I was fascinated to learn about it, this capacity that some plants have to remove toxins from the soil through their root structure was interesting to me and became a springboard for this first series of drawings, some of which you can see over my shoulder. Um, they're called the, the wild plant series. Um, you know, I, I grew up on a sugar plantation. My father was a farmer. I've been curious about the plantation as an economic model that has shaped everything about Barbados and the Caribbean and very curious about the landscape, which has always formed the baseline in my own work. And like many Bajans, I would see these wild plants as weeds. I mean, this is something that farmers wanted to remove from sugarcane fields and from, uh, you know, lands that grew brown provisions. But as I've tried to sort of reorient my own understanding of this land and our history, um, some of that comes through walking the fields. So I walk the fields at Walkers on a very regular basis, and I started to turn my attention towards these wild botanicals that we often ignore. And I started collecting them and pressing them and drying them and drawing them. And around the same time, I stumbled upon hundreds of plantation ledger pages in this um, bookkeeper's office at Cliff Plantation in St. John, where I grew up. So the drawings that you're seeing in the image are actually drawn on these old plantation ledger pages from the 70s and the 80s. Um, and as you would know, these ledger pages are this was a kind of an accounting methodology that the British Empire used all over the world. So all of the data was entered, registering wages, field activity, rent roll, measuring rainfall, signing out agricultural implements to plantation laborers. And this is what the British did all over the world. And it suggests this incredible sense of order um, in these very neatly delineated rows and columns that everything was very ordered. But of course, underneath all of this order, there was a certain measure of chaos through the trauma of the, the plantation system as it developed here in Barbados. Um, and so I thought that I would want to work on these ledger pages to sort of offer an alternative to the single economic story that we hear about the plantation. And rather than just um, having this daily logging of information. I wanted to inscribe other images that would allow us to read the site differently. Mm -hmm. So the collecting of these plants and the drawing of them and inserting them onto the plantation ledger page means that that ledger page becomes a kind of a, a substrate or a palimpsest that in and of itself houses a certain kind of information, but I'm kind of countering that. And so I, I was interested in seeing these plants as active agents themselves in the process of decolonizing the land. And yeah. I, I saw them as performing this quiet revolution in the fields where they would assert themselves against this imperial monocrop landscape. 
Um, and so putting them into this onto the ledger page was a way to sort of affirm that they exist, um, that they also speak to a, a, the increase of biodiversity in Barbados, the greatest sense of biodiversity that we have since the late 17th century, connected to the reduction of arable land being used to grow sugar cane. Yeah. Uh, and these other plants and trees are growing. So it was really this idea of documenting the site where I live and work in a different kind of way and to give visibility to things that we were taught to ignore or get rid of. Yeah. Um, and the color of the drawing is is also pulling on the color of the the columns in some of the ledger pages are this kind of Victorian rose. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of mimicking that color, also thinking about gender and body fluids, uh, fragility, strength, um, and this idea about nurturing the land differently. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting, you know, they say that uh, art mimics life. And, you know, the, the whole process of phytoremediation, um, you have plants that release natural substances through their roots, supplying nutrients to microorganisms in the soil. The microorganisms in the soil enhance the biological um, degradation. And then there's that whole chemical process that takes place, you know, with the phytostabilization. There's also that chemical process that takes place mm -hmm. where the soil, the, the plants remove contaminants from the soil, right? And further degrade them. And so you know, everybody knows healthy soil, food, right? And so here you, you've you really been able to demonstrate in a very creative and artistic way, a very, very scientific concept, you know, and then tying it into um, the thing that has grounded many of our, well, all of our Caribbean islands, which is colonialism. Yeah. Um, and so really it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful intersection of science and of history, of art, and showing how all of these things can come together to send a message and to give mm -hmm. a story. Um, and you know, for us, uh, we, we, we have uh, one of our permaculture com specialists, he usually says, you know, bush is good. <laughs> Absolutely. I know we're, we're gonna be talking more about bush today, yes, but bush that's is right. good. That's and right. um, in the Caribbean, we've been we've been conditioned to think bush is bad. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and using, right? weeding it out and using chemicals. Weeding it out, exactly, exactly. It goes down into, well, in our case, you know, these underground aquifers. And so, yes. you know, polluting the water that we're drinking, yes. um, you know, is which has just been a, a had, has had a terrible impact. Um, so yes, I was yeah. trying to get rid of it. But now, you know, I was inspired by Sean Carrington's book as well, The Wild Plants of Barbados. It's an amazing yeah. Bible for uh -huh. that, right? So it gives us a lot of information about the value of these of these plants. Definitely. And I think so much of that has been lost. I mean, outside of the the, the, the different impacts that colonialism has had mm -hmm. on us as a people, mm -hmm. it's also had an impact on our agriculture. It has impact on our agriculture our actual land and the way that we perceive the things that were natural to most of our lands. Right. Right. So it really is a very, very interesting. And so I'm going to take us further down the rabbit hole. It's a very okay. interesting rabbit hole, right? I'm going to take us further down the rabbit hole and let's, let's go into another piece of your work. Um, the Bush Tea Service Project, right? So could you explain to us, um, your bush tea service project and the link to the preservation of bush teas as a medium for collecting and retaining the rich biodiversity heritage of Barbados. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, so bush tea services is, um, I was commissioned by a UK based curatorial team called Cooking Sections for their pop-up exhibition in 2016 that was called the Empire Remains Shop in London. And I worked with Hamilton Wiltshire, who's a Barbadian kind of master potter. Um, and I decided that I would make this tea service as a way to speak back to the British tradition of drinking tea, which was the second most drunk beverage in the UK after water. Um, and so this is a piece that sort of dismantles the English tea set. It's a sort of a creolized version of the tea set that we're more familiar with, because if you look closely, the, the object in the center of that table is patterned after the monkey jar. And mm. then it's got a series of six teacups and saucers. They're sitting on the plantation ledger page and there's some artifacts there. 
Um, when I walk the fields here at Walkers, I find these 18th and 19th century shards. So in addition to collecting wild plants, I'm also collecting these shards that are not peculiar to walkers in St. George. They're all over Barbados and all over the Caribbean. And they're these shards that are, you know, crockery from, um, you know, tea sets and cheap crockery that would have come in on the ships as uh, ballast. Um, and so I decided that I would create this, repurpose these fragments and include them in this new tea service from which I would serve unsweetened varieties of bush tea. So I right. would harvest these plants so it would be Circe, uh, that has a particularly strong taste, um, bay leaf, blue vervain, lemongrass. Um, and when I took it to the UK as a kind of a dispersive performative project, it was shown, this image is from uh, the exhibition in Texas, but when I took it to the UK, I was in a storefront window of a former bank on Baker Street in London, and people would sign up to come and have tea with me. And I would serve tea in these, um, imperfect cups because they when i insert the shards into the clay there there's um it's not a perfect insertion and so there are these leaks that happen so i would uh pour the tea it would leak from the from the monkey jar i would pour it mm -hmm. into the cup and as you would drink it would leak and so the idea around there was sort of speaking to this incomplete history that we've inherited um, a lack of information about what has gone before. Yeah. Um, and also referring, you know, tea is something that there was an English abolitionist called Robert Southey that referred to tea as a blood sweetened beverage. So alternatively, what I'm trying to do with Bush Tea Services is I'm trying to recall uh, the way in which Bush Tea was used by the enslaved. So many enslaved people would have used Bush Tea, which um, for medicinal purposes in baths, in teas mm -hmm. for healing, for spiritual or ritualistic practices to prevent or terminate unwanted pregnancies. And these teas were often brewed from the plants that were grown in these small plots, hedgerows, gullies, um, and consumed for these medicinal, spiritual and healing properties. So that's been a kind of a covert practice. Um, and I thought it would be it would be valuable to go back to that practice and to think about offering this almost as a small act of reparation in the UK. What was surprising to me was that most of the people that came into the into the window shop and I would serve tea to talk about the shared transatlantic history that very few of these people actually knew about what I was talking, even oh, though wow. our sugar yeah. industry um, provided wealth and modernized the UK they seem to be unfamiliar with this shared transatlantic history. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what that piece is trying to do. So the, the, the bush tea element, so the teas that you chose and stuff like that, they, they were from walkers. Yes. Where did you get your information from? How did you go about doing that research? How did you go about choosing the teas that took part of this process? Right. So uh, I've often gone to um, Sean Carrington's book, The Wild Plants of Barbados. And then, of course, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole of what you can find on the Internet. Yeah. Um, but I've also spoken. There's a, a botanist and a spiritual healer here called Ras Isles, and he has a lot of information mm -hmm. about yeah. the use of plants. Um, and it was also looking at what was available on this land and also thinking about taste. So knowing that Circe bush is something that is like a vermifuge or it has the capacity to purify your blood or remove parasites or toxins from the system um, and then adding the bay leaf and the lemongrass that also have healing properties but because it would have a more pleasant taste yeah um, the blue vervain is something that would have been used for wounds so mm -hmm. i would imagine that you know enslaved people uh would have you know this was an apothecary for them it was a yeah. way to try and heal psycho spiritually you know physically um and to pass on information so just doing research also iris banneke uh who had the andromeda gardens she has yeah. uh, some information so um yeah just trying to glean what i can from what's available locally and to uh, tap into people who have so much more knowledge than i do yeah i mean um, from what you've mentioned i mean we do have a lot of local resources i think 
one of the things that we need to focus on is documenting this knowledge Absolutely. that so many people have. Um, last week, I spoke to Dr. Sonia Peter, and I know when we were talking, you you know, it, there was a lot of similarities between the, the uses and everything that she was talking about from a scientific mm -hmm. point of view of the bush tea and the essence of the bush tea. And then you, from an artistic point of view, bringing its relevance to, to the full. And right. I mean, it really does, it really does board on those of us who are within the space right now and understand the importance of these things to make sure that it's documented. And yes. I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but mm -hmm. you're also in the process of making sure that those things are being documented. Yes. So if you're joining us for the first time, if you're just joining us, I am speaking here with Annalie Davis, a renowned Barbadian artist. Um, she has done work all over the world. And we are looking today at a number of her creative pieces um, that focus on regenerative ag elements of regenerative agriculture, elements of um, our history here in Barbados and across the Caribbean, really, um, and how there is that linkage between regenerative agriculture and um, the work that she's doing. Uh, so we're going to move into the to the next piece. Um, and this also plays on the whole bush tea concept. And this one is the bush tea plots. Right. Um, your work, Bush Tea Plots, you, uh, you say that it confronts the damages of monocropping sugarcane um, to the soil and the damages, of course, to society, the, to the Caribbean society. And it presents and acknowledges the resilience of our regenerative biosphere and its inherent capacity for healing at the agricultural, botanical and psycho spiritual levels. So the question here is, how does your project, Bush Tea Plots, offer a curative space um, collaboratively brought to life through art, landscape architecture, and botany. So the, the full title of the work is Bush Tea Plots, A Decolonial Patch, and it, it builds further on the first two works that we've spoken about, Keisha, in that, you know, moving from the drawing to the Bush Tea Services, this is actually a living apothecary. Um, so that. I was commissioned by the World Bank Group. They had a risk and resilience conference um, at the EBCCI at Cave Hill here in Barbados. So this work is now permanently installed on site at the EBCCI. And I worked in collaboration with Kevin Talma, yeah. who I know has done a number of the courses at, um, at the CPRI, and Ras Isles. So we were linking art practice, landscape architecture with Kevin, and botany and spiritual healing with Ras Isles. So the idea Excellent. is to create this living restorative plot that becomes this apothecary of resistance and it offers a healing space. I've been thinking a lot uh, about how we form new relationships with the land, given that there is a virtual slaughterhouse that sits below the soil all over this country, given the traumatic history that we have. That we have. Um, and so I'm thinking about this work as an opportunity to do that. So it, it confronts this, the idea of this historical imposition of the monocrop mm -hmm. by recognizing nature as this radical agent of resistance against the singular model of the plantation. And, and so the other word that I have been learning about is the plantationocene, which is this it's term plantationocene. So uh -huh. it's part of the Anthropocene. Yeah. It is a term developed by Donna Haraway and Anna Singh that acknowledges the role of the plantation, farm plus industry equals plantation or scene, the role of the plantation in contributing to the sixth extinction, right? So this work attempts to observe how the natural world is threatened and degraded, but it also acknowledges the, the resilience of our regenerative biosphere and its inherent capacity to heal agriculturally, you know, botanically, psycho-spiritually. So what you're looking at here is this glass planter that shows the soil profile. So the rhizosphere um, that is nurturing this nurturing environment. Uh, so there's this limestone at the base. There's uh, some of the shards are in there. Then there's the soil. Uh, there's a curated selection of 12 medicinal plants with healing properties. Mm -hmm. um, and it's trying to create the visibility of these near extinct covert Afro-spiritual bush tea customs. Um, so that that work is um, probably struggling a little bit right now under the drought and <laughs> lockdown because I can't get there as often to water it. But yeah, so it's it's located there. Uh, excellent. I see that there is a QR code on the on the work. What what's what's the what's happening there? 
So the QR code actually takes you to a discrete site. It's called Bush Deep Plots. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, a resource section. So there's information on the 12 plants that were curated to be included there. Uh, there's also a research section. So that would have in a PDF of Iris Banneke's uh, Barbados Museum and Historical Society Journal article. Yeah. Um, you know, so it has historical and maybe some more contemporary. There's a sort of a bibliography, there are images, there's text about the project. And it, it also links, it, it speaks about Sylvia Winter's conversations and essays about the plot versus the plantation and how the plot was a pre-capitalist site that housed tradition and memory. It was a way for enslaved people to commune to share knowledge, to pass on information within this larger capitalist space of the plantation. So, you know, it's this interesting space where she spoke, speaks about um, the plot as a use value space rather than a commercial space. So that's why I'm also using the word plot. Um, it's, it's another way of working, uh, working in the land within that larger context of the plantation. Yeah. So if you're if you're interested, which I'm talking to the audience, if you're interested in um, reading up more of this stuff, we have um, and and these various um, sites rolling across in the ticker bar, but we're also posting it in the comment section, so you can always copy and paste them and or click them and go to her page. Just don't click them right now and leave our session. Click them after. <laughs> they will be there. They'll be available for you. All right. Um, so, you know, for me, one of the things that really resonates with this piece is that whole idea that, you know, we're increasing the knowledge and the cultivation of native medicinal plants that actually proliferate the island. Um, and, you know, it, it gives us such a biodiverse landscape and it's teaching us resilience um, and teaching us resilience to through what is already available right. in the environment. Right. Rather than relying on imported pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Um, and so that whole again, that link, that holistic link to regenerative agriculture and how these um, and how the, the things that we we take for granted and we have taken for granted for so mm -hmm. long for the various reasons that we yeah. do. Um, they have such a strong link to, to how, to how we, we feed ourselves, how we, how we take care of our health, how we take care of our wellness and all of those things. And so much um, more obvious now in this COVID moment, right? It is. Yeah. It is very, yeah. very, very much so. I mean, yeah. you know, these plants have medicinal value, but they also provide things to the soil um, that allows food crops to grow. Right, mm -hmm. the same food crops that we need to become food secure. Absolutely. You know, um, in looking at our when I first started working with Wired, um, you know, and I was learning about the our Walkers Reserve project, it literally just blew my mind how interdependent all these different plants were um, in our permaculture system, and you know, things that you wouldn't think had uh, some uh, such a positive impact mm -hmm. on other things within the system, um, it did. You know, and so to really see that interconnectedness, this is a beautiful artistic demonstration of that. I know that you um, are very much an advocate for the arts here in the Caribbean um, and creating spaces for Caribbean artists to really have a voice. Um, and Fresh Milk is one of those spaces. Uh, Fresh Milk, your vision is to nurture, empower and connect Caribbean artists raise regional awareness about contemporary arts and provide global opportunities for growth, excellence and success. But what does that really mean? Tell us about fresh milk. Tell us a bit about fresh milk. Um, what is it? its role? What, it, what type of work are you doing at Fresh Milk? So Fresh, fresh Milk was, uh, I founded Fresh Milk in 2011. Um, since 2012, I've been working with uh, my colleague, Catherine Kennedy. Um, and we have been shaping a number of projects uh, over the last one from nine years. Um, it is also linked to the concept of fighter remediation in that it's the idea of intervening a cultural project into the site of a former plantation. And we have a library of three and a half thousand books focused on the arts, one of the strongest libraries for the arts on the island. Um, and it's thinking about how to push back against a particular history that we've inherited. Our history is not one of nurturing. So Fresh yeah. Milk is a nurturing platform. I often feel that artists in Barbados and the Caribbean comprise an at-risk group 
there's so little uh, support for contemporary practitioners. And when I taught at Barbados Community College, I noticed that even though the state was offering five years of a free program at the degree level, there was no thought into what would happen to these graduates when they left. So in 2010-11, we had a very strong group of students graduating and I was worried that we would lose them to working in the restaurant industry to um, selling clothes, you know, waiting tables and set up fresh milk as a kind of an experiment to um, provide a kind of a bridge between uh, college and being a professional and offering some kind of developmental support. So we have been housing a residency program. We've hosted almost 65 artists locally and from around the Caribbean and around the world. We co-manage a regional residency in Aruba called Caribbean Linked that includes artists from all four linguistic areas on a biannual basis. They come in and live together for three weeks with a very strong national identity and they leave with a very strong regional identity. We also co-manage, uh, I co-founded and, and co-manage Tilting Access, which is um, an annual meeting that um, is looking at what it takes to have a healthy cultural ecosystem in the visual arts sector. And we also manage something called Transoceanic Visual Exchange, which, which Catherine does with Natalie McGuire. Um, and that's a digital platform, mostly for people working with um, kind of new media and film installation. So I feel as though this idea of fighter remediation also inhabits that cultural activism work in that it's the insertion of a cultural project into this um, historically traumatic environment that moves against that um, harsh history to offer a nurturing platform to bring together young creative people um, and to offer a nurturing space where people can think and, and make work and read and write. Um, and so it, it really moves against that historical grain by offering a safe space for, for artists who feel quite marginal uh, often to the mainstream. Okay, excellent. Um, what are the challenges? I mean, this seems like a very big undertaking. And what are some of the challenges that you have, you have experienced? And um, what would you like the audience and possibly policymakers and funders to know about Fresh Milk and what it is that you're doing? So the challenge, I mean, we're connected in spirit to a lot of other artist-led initiatives around the Caribbean. So mm -hmm. Fresh Milk is in sync with what other small spaces are doing. Our challenge, Keisha, really is that at the um, there, there's very little philanthropic support for the arts. I think our sense of corporate social responsibility in Barbados tends to work more towards sport or um, you know maybe young people with health challenges or you know physical challenges. Um, so there's not a lot of support at the philanthropic level for a developmental organization like Fresh Milk, which is not entrepreneurial. We do not have a product to sell. We are offering support to young artists um, and, and that, that's required, but it's not entrepreneurial. So we don't have this product to send to market. I think also at the state level, we were born in the economic recession. We came out um, you know, in 2011. So in terms of support at the state level, there has been some support, but it's, it's very difficult for us to um, be financially viable. So we are streamlining what we're doing and trying to find support for projects that kind of match um, partners that we want to work with. I think also the challenge is that our educational level, a lot of kids drop art after form three, oh. right? So if they're not getting educated about art in prime in secondary school there's no national art gallery there's no contemporary art museum uh we're yeah. not a, a library you know we don't go to lots of libraries how are we actually educating ourselves to become visually literate mm -hmm. uh, so we're functioning in a in a context that's really challenging on the upside there's an incredible amount of work being produced by super smart we work with very intelligent really creative talented, wonderful young people here and across the Caribbean. And there is no shortage of talent and committed people. What's missing is that fuller kind of um, architecture to support, to support uh, it, the, the spaces, arts in general it, and yeah. contemporary art, you know? 
the physical spaces to be able to support mm -hmm. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know, you know, you've just shared a very, very small taste of the work that you've been doing with us. I mean, you know, in going through your work online, it's so extensive and there's so many different elements. Um, and I know that you do have a lot of projects in the offering in the future. Um, so let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of your future projects um, and what work you're going to be doing in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, uh, we are going to be collaborating um, on uh, something called Bush Tea Plot, a restorative apothecary. Um, and as I continue to, to think about the land and uh, this idea around the bush tea plots, one of the things I'm looking forward to doing post lockdown, um, when we're able to, to put work on this project together, you know, it's always thinking about how to love and care for lands from which we have felt alienated and traumatized um, in, in Barbados and the Caribbean. So one of the things that we'll be working on together with um, Walker's Reserve and the CPRI is this restorative apothecary um, that fits into this larger ethos of regenerative work. Um, and thinking about intimacy with the land how can we have a more meaningful connection with the land, with the history and with the power of the feminine? Yeah. Um, so it's again, pulling on these earlier works around the wild botanicals, um, healing, ritualistic, medicinal, spiritual practices by the enslaved, consuming these uh, wild plants for medicinal purposes, spiritually for healing. So again, recognizing these near extinct practices um, and talking about how wild plants remediate the landscape, offer reprieve and restoration. So what we're gonna be looking at is shifting a little bit to ideas around uh, women's health, reproductive and post-reproductive female bodies. Um, mm -hmm. I've been doing work called Second Spring, which has brought me into this. So we're looking at how do women's bodies age? Uh, what? How do we talk about post-reproductive bodies in kind of contemporary societies? Um, and what I've learned from that is while that experience has often been, um, we inherit that experience from a very kind of patriarchal negative understanding about being past your cell by date or you know, no longer having value because you're no longer reproductive thinking about the power of growing older, the wildness, the, the, the sense of uh, clarity, um, and all kinds of positive things that can come with wisdom of growing older. So yeah. what, what, we're, what I'd like to do with this, uh, this new project is outside of now that vitrine for the bush plots, the decolonial patch, will be an actual medicinal garden um, yeah. on site at your location. Yeah. Um, so there will be plants that are looking at um, women's reproductive and post-reproductive health, looking at the enslaved medicinal plant usage. Um, there will be then the QR codes that will give information about the selected plants. There will be a yes. you know, link into your web platform to have research and information there. Yeah. Um, a kind of a first aid section for people who are working there that they could use. Yeah. A site of inspiration, reflection, beauty, um, and just, yeah, contributing in a small way to that, that larger um, landscape that you have. Uh, so that's Definitely. one of the things that I'll do. And I'm very excited, very, very excited about that project. Because yes. um, I feel that it falls squarely within our ethos at Wired. Um, and we are constantly looking for ways to engage the creative sector, to engage the RG economy in the regenerative agriculture process, in mm -hmm. the climate resilient process, mm -hmm. um, and to have this garden on site that not only has its regenerative agriculture elements, but to have this huge symbolic element right. too as well, and to tell such an amazing narrative. Um, it really ties in um, for us at Walker's Reserve and at Wyatt, mm -hmm. it ties in the whole element of um, cultural capital because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, if you've been listening to our shows, you would have heard us talk about different types of capital, mm -hmm. cultural capital, intellectual capital, financial capital. And this is a perfect intersection of that cultural capital, mm -hmm. bringing mm -hmm. in those elements. 
Um, there's a huge, beautiful gender element too as well that is often ignored in a lot of the work that is done within the Caribbean. Um, and then there's also the science, the you know, the agriculture. It's it's a it's a really beautiful melting pot of um, I think representative mm -hmm. of everything that we stand for as an organization. Mm -hmm. So I am looking forward personally to that project. Yeah, I'm looking life. forward to having people come out to Walkers when it's up and running. Yeah. Um, post COVID. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, <laughs> to, and, to, and, to see yeah. it. And also yeah. to say that there's a component in there which will include a series of drawings of those plants. And Perfect. those drawings, I'm beginning to experiment with making inks and dyes and stains with natural product. So yeah. I've been um like brewing mahogany um bark and pods turmeric you know so pressing turmeric and drawing with turmeric mm -hmm. um uh i i would this is a, a a call here i want to get some indigo so if anybody knows where i can get indigo locally i would love to draw with some uh see what i can i can do with that Put it in the um, chat. The chat will be available after the okay. fact in the recording. So if right. you have in the go in your you're in the audience, you know where she can get some. Right. And put it yes. in the chat. Perfect. Yes. Um, so doing drawings of the plants that would then become part of the site there, um, and but working kind of experimenting with natural dyes and stains to be able to make those drawings. Um, you know, I think it also acknowledges the migration of seeds. Mm -hmm. of species, of cultural traditions, of people, of spiritual practices. Um, and, and this focus on women's health, you know, as you said, it kind of, a lot of research ends up happening on male health. So, you know, this, that we are yeah. trying to think about, um, about women's health in, in this as well. Excellent. Um, is there anything else um, that you, that you want to mention before we go into questions from the audience? Well, I, I would just say that the the other series that, I mean, I was actually supposed to be getting on a plane today to be going to <laughs> do a whole host of projects, uh, including the opening of an, an exhibition, a group exhibition in Austria. And I would just share that some of the work there is called the Parasite Series. And mm -hmm. um, that series is inspired by a Cuban essayist called Antonio Benitez Rojo. And he speaks about Caribbean history as this... Um, long annelid parasite that's been moving through the bowels of the region and that made me think about the extractive economy on which our economies are built so uh, i've been also thinking about these ideas of, of like a kind of a parasitic history and so these are a series of drawings of um, the body of a woman looking at meeting these parasites and trying to um, understand them um, you know, eventually expurgate them from her system, uh, make peace with them. Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, I think in a lot of ways, the work really ties back to um, the site of the plantation and yeah. how to unpack that in, in a variety of ways. So um, right. and doing some writing as well. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, we're going to go into questions from the audience. If you're just joining us for the first time, I am talking to renowned Barbadian artist, Annalie Davis. Uh, she's also the founder of the artist-led connective Fresh Milk. Um, if you are interested in any of Annalie's work, we are posting the links to her work in the, con um, in the comment section, um, but it's also running across the ticker right now um, with the with uh, links to her various platforms. All right, so let's go into questions from the audience. Let's have our first question from the audience. Um, and it's from Sinon Hill Plantation. And it says, are there examples of public spaces other than Yui where persons can experience bush as medicine and art? Hmm. Thank you. Uh, um, from Sinon Hill Plantation. Um, I in Barbados, let's think about that. I mean, I know there are other spaces, I mean, there's peg farms and there's this beautiful, I think it's a biodynamic garden that they had there and that's where I met Ras Isles. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the art of creating that kind of garden. Um, I guess I would also think about the art of food uh, maybe and the ways in which, um, so sort of moving outside uh, maybe the question that you have around visual art, but you know, there are some really incredible chefs that are beginning to work with local produce 
Um, and I think that that is something that's really interesting and is going to develop even more as a result of the pandemic and the, the threats to our kind of food sovereignty and food security. Um, yeah. Can I think about other people that are working with? Bushnet? I know that there is a um, project that's currently underway at Codrington College, right? Um, and it's a medicinal garden as that's well. Right. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure how far along they are, but I do. I do believe that Ross Isles is also involved in that project as well. So they've and, got two acres, I believe, and there's a connection with UE doing research. Um, yes, there are four plants. So I think it's blue vervain, aloes, lemongrass, and maybe Circe. I stand yes. to be corrected, um, but I'm not. I don't know that they're seeing that as an art project. So yeah. yeah. So so there's obviously room room for your work, yeah. Emily. Room for your work, definitely. Um, and you know, not to toot our own horn, but hopefully very soon too as well. The medicinal garden at Walker's Reserve will be a space where there's bush tea and art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's have another question from the audience. All right, and this is from our YouTube um, viewers. Um, we're really excited to be streaming live from YouTube from last week. So you can join us directly from YouTube if you don't have Facebook, or if your friend doesn't have Facebook and it stopped them from watching, now they can watch on YouTube. Um, and from YouTube, ba Bartos? Bartos. I, yeah, I am really sorry if I mispronounced your name, but Anne Lee just got it correct. So <laughs> we're going to go with her her pronunciation, right? And it's apart from the obvious, travel restrictions that must have affected your work and your freshman residency initiatives, how has the pandemic affected your artistic and activist practice so far? So thanks, Bartosz. Bartosz is based in Poland. Oh, um, lovely. And, um, Thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, you know, in some ways, it almost forces there's a bit of an existential crisis around what va what's the value of doing what we're doing and how do you know what's the value of the work that I'm doing in this moment so we don't want the pandemic to um, influence everything that we're going to do um, I have found it quite difficult to make um, new work during during the, the moment I, I actually will share with you because I have this is something I've been working with and photographing for some time. Um, I've been drying these cactus um, since August, and I'm so amazed that they continue to put out new life. Um, so here's this piece that is like almost on its very last leg, and it's made me think a lot about resilience and tenacity within the context of small island developing states like the one we live in and the kinds yeah. of decisions that we make going forward. What is the role of culture in a space like this and in a moment like this and, you know, might things change? So I've been writing more um, mm -hmm. and, um, and thinking, you know, gathering more of these plants around me, like these dried papaw leaves from the trees on my land um, and, and working with these cactus. But, finding it actually difficult even though my life hasn't changed dramatically because i live on my own i work in a studio on my own i i walk the fields on my own um but i it's obviously by osmosis i'm being impacted by this moment so it's forcing mm -hmm. me to pause i would say oh excellent you mentioned that you've been writing um do you have anything that you want to share with us from that angle um i know yeah. you told me about a book Yes. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I do have, um, there's this book, which is called On Being Committed to a Small Place. It's a bilingual uh -huh. publication. Mm -hmm. uh, it was edited, um, produced by Teoretica, which is a space in San Jose in Costa Rica. Um, it's a series of six essays where I'm talking about, um, well, what it means to be committed to art in a small place like this and the madness of being um an artist in a place where there isn't the infrastructure to support it. There isn't a national art gallery or a contemporary yes. art museum. Um, so it's it's a series of six essays and a conversation with the editor, Miguel Lopez, who is mm -hmm. the um, the director of Teoretica in Costa Rica. Um, it uh, has about 50 images in it and it's both in Spanish and English. So that was launched in 
um, October of last year in Costa Rica, along with um, my exhibition called Heart Seed. Oh, lovely. All right. So I say we have some more questions from the audience. Okay. So let's let's see what we have. Oh, another YouTube listener, Natalie. I'm thinking of sustainability and longevity. What advice do you have for young creative cultural workers who wish to continue the pioneering work you and others have done for the region? Thank you very much for your question, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Natalie's in the Bahamas. Ah. Um, thank wow, you. We have a very, very international crowd today. Excellent. <laughs> um, I, I think that the thing to do is to build community within the space where you're working, but also across the region. Um, I, I am not a nationalist. I'm very much a regionalist. And I feel that we are working in very small countries and there's such small numbers of us that we often feel quite isolated. So I think looking at um, existing programs that exist around the Caribbean and maybe contributing to the ones that exist, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are all kinds of great programs that are happening around the region. Um, I think trying to tap into that and to build your community nationally and regionally so that you don't feel isolated, so that when you're going crazy in these small places that can send us crazy when we choose to <laughs> love a career that makes no sense uh, in small places like this, that you have a community that you can reach out to because I think um, our own mental health uh, is taking a beating from this moment. And so it's to feel that you've got colleagues, um, you know, who are working towards the sustainability of this really important sector. Uh, so form alliances. Oh, beautiful. All right, let's take another question from the audience. All right, this question is from Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Anneli, in your visit to Aruba, have you noticed their well-scale cultivation of aloe barbadinus? Uh, barbadinus? Uh, they produce a number of uh, products for local use and exportation. Is there scope to bring this crop home? The ultimate, sorry, the ultimate in resilience and tenacity and to interrogate its place in our botanical and cultural history. Yes, I mean, I have seen uh, the aloes in Aruba and I have seen all of the products that they sell with aloes, you know, the sun lotion, the after sun, the body lotion, all of these things, you know, chapsticks and everything. Um, there's almost, ver there's very little that grows there, right? So that is a super resilient and tenacious plant. And I do think that there's a room, there's room for that. I, I really feel that what we're learning now about this pandemic is this, thing about a monocrop, whether it's the plantation or tourism, we really need to get out of that and, uh, and learn more about these crops like aloes and to see ways in which we can develop that for ourselves. And like Mahmoud was saying yesterday, not for tourism to be the end, but in some ways a means to an end so that we're contributing to our own economy, not doing everything for for the, the visitor or the tourist, but thinking about having a richer, you know, before people come in from outside and want to take and patent and do whatever, we should be doing that. I think there's huge scope uh, for that here. I mean, I'm not a farmer, right? So, but I think, you know, that's certainly something that we could be considering. So, Annalie, that's a message that, you know, has resonated throughout each of our sessions. One, the appreciation for what it is that we have here um and yes named after, named after excellent because <laughs> i was like this is where you need your glasses but my glasses <laughs> reflects on the screen so <laughs> i have to do these sessions without my glasses <laughs> um but yeah you know it, it's it's that you know constant um appreciation one for what we have but then taking that appreciation for what we have and being able to um create livelihood opportunities out of it and not just waiting for people from the outside to tell us um oh or to come and steal to, i don't want to say steal but take the yeah. idea um uh, because we didn't capitalize on it right um any more questions from the audience all right so we have a question from edgewaters um on youtube so excited to see so many questions from our youtube listeners this is great um, what more can be done in schools to encourage inspiring artists to continue art as a career path? During my school years, art, music, and agriculture were always looked over as viable career paths. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of kids tend to drop out in Form 3, as I said before. Um, thank you, Edgewaters. Um, I think maybe it needs to have more resonance. Maybe the syllabus needs to reflect the lived reality of what, um, and to become, I mean, this, you know, we work with contemporary artists at Fresh Milk and it's, it's something, sometimes people feel disconnected from work that's being currently produced, but I, I feel that what we're seeing coming out of our young artists is a new way of looking at ourselves, a new way of understanding the world that we live in. It's moving beyond, these sort of um, stereotypical tropes that we are all accustomed to seeing in the more kind of, um, you know, commercial renderings of what it means to be a Barbadian or a Caribbean person. And I think we need to encourage in our students that art is something that can be integrated into all of our subjects. So you can think creatively no matter what you're doing. Um, but, you know, I, I guess there's also tension and, and, from parents or pressure about sustainability. And so very often when children want to choose that career, there isn't a lot of support for it. So we need to change our whole mindset. Um, and that needs to happen at the state level by creating platforms for people to be able to access arts freely and easily. And you know, so it's not just this kind of highbrow activity. Um, that's that's a tough it's a tough question because it's huge we could talk about that for a long time there's a massive amount of infrastructure that needs to be put in place both at the social uh, at the physical at the everything level to yes. be able to have that happen um i know that for myself when i you know was in school i loved anthropology like if i if i thought i could get a job with anthropology that is every that. single elective that i have was history anthropology um and so, yeah, it, it really, really is, is, it's a struggle. All right, so our next question is from Patrick. Patrick, what is that, uh, what, why is it that artistic endeavors are never taken seriously enough to have a more significant impact on policy? Thanks, Patrick. I mean, again, we can talk about this for a very long time, but I feel that there is a disconnect between the policymakers and the legislators and what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. For example, um, while our government um, was speaking about making um, financial, um, you know, allocations for people within this COVID moment, it was interesting to me that while a, a million dollars is being allocated to the cultural sector, there was this kind of caveat that artists had to demonstrate value and um, or that, that, that the work that we do needs to have in a COVID message. Now, this was not required of any other sector. Um, I find it interesting that at, our, at the state level, you're asking artists to demonstrate value for them to be able to apply for funding. Um, I, you know, I think, one of the reasons it's not taken seriously is maybe because people really just don't understand the sector well enough. And That's what true. artists are concerned about is that they see the sector as a cash cow, as a way to contribute maybe to taxes or to increase the economy, but they've actually missed this huge section in between where um, how do you go from a BCC student to generating, you know, real money towards the economy, if there isn't this kind of bridge in between and an entire supportive network like you may have in farming, which of mm -hmm. course also has its issues, but maybe there's a marketing component or there's these, you know, programs that can allow people to transition. We actually are lacking that. So we can't go from being a student to contributing within the context of not having uh, the proper infrastructure there to support, you know, to have the curators and the historians and the writers and the institutions and the museums and the funding and the grants and the biennials and the trade fairs and the writers. If that whole sector isn't fully fleshed out, it's very difficult for us to, to contribute. And so I feel that the, the impact from the policymakers and the legislators is it, it's that they want us to be entrepreneurial all of the time, but they're missing out that kind of big developmental moment. So there's a real chasm between the cultural practitioners and those who sit on the other side at the state level, I think. No, I, 
completely understand, completely agree. Um, I was going to ask you to actually talk about that as our closing statement. You know, I can't believe it, but an hour has actually passed already. This has been a very engaging conversation. Um, so what I'm going to do is take one last question instead, because you, you've answered my last question, my closing question. And this one is from Holly. Um, Holly, thank you, Annalie. Energetically, what wild plants are you most drawn to and why? Hmm. Well, I'm, I, I'm always collecting Circe. <laughs> um, I, there's a beautiful patch that I find when I walk and it's just on a side of a field that I noticed this morning when I was walking is now gone um, because that field has just been cut. Um, and I've started to grow it and I'm intrigued by that because of its healing properties. It tastes terrible to me on its own, but I'm very interested in that. Um, I'm also trying to, I'm growing uh, Queen Anne's Lace. I, I, uh, I probably shouldn't say this on here, but I did bring back in some seeds from Vermont where I was a resident there last fall. We didn't hear that. <laughs> And we I've didn't been, hear that. <laughs> I've been, I'm trying to grow the, the Queen Anne's Lace. I mean, this is a, a wild plant that used to be quite common when I was a child and you can't find it anywhere. Um, but it's been a very, it's a plant that I'm drawn to. I've drawn it a lot. Uh, I'm interested in that, um, that beautiful, um, all of that, those white, small white flowers that, I mean, it's actually a, this is kind of what it looks like when it's dried and pressed. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. So I've been working with that a lot. I would say the Circe and and the Queen Anne's lace. Um, I, I mean, there there are several. I mean, I'm really drawn to the bay leaf, and I'm really drawn to the lemongrass as well. Um, but I also realize that I know so little, and that we haven't been taught very much about this and it's really trying to learn it on on a number of levels so um yeah all right beautiful i think that's a nice end a nice personal touch to the end of our conversation and lee thank you so much for joining us this has truly been enjoyable um you know i i really enjoyed going through the wells of your your creative works um and i know that you have so much more to come and so much more to share so thank you for spending the time to share with us today um if you missed any part of today's session you don't worry it's on our youtube channel all you have to do is click and subscribe and you can get all of our content that we're dishing out weekly. Uh, next week, Tuesday, next week, Tuesday, join us as we have a special edition as well. Um, next week, Tuesday, the 19th, Ian McNeil, the founding director of Wired um, and the Walkers Reserve Project. He will be exploring beyond corporate social responsibility with Gregory Landua, the Chief Regenerative Officer of the Regen Network, and Ethan Solovier, Chief Innovation Officer of HowGood.com. And then again, join me on Thursday at our new time of 1 p.m., because you asked for the new time of 1 p.m., uh, for another creative session uh, with creative producer um, and architect, Israel Map of Union collaborative. We really look forward to having you next week. Join us, be safe, and have a good day. Bye.